My name is Amy Calhoun. Thank you so much for introducing me, Heidi. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota, and I'm a board certified pediatrician and medical geneticist. And so I primarily practice clinical medical genetics. I see patients with genetic conditions. And I am just delighted to come here and talk to you about my very favorite genetic condition, which is Wolf-Hirschhorn syndrome. And I'm sure everybody's looking at my title and wondering why it says 4P minus disorders instead of Wolf Hershorn, and I'm going to get to that. But first, I am so absolutely delighted to be here. I can't even tell you how excited I am. Full disclosure, I'm a Norwegian American, so I'm. This is the first time I've been in Norway, and I'm so excited. I can't even, I can't even say how excited I am to be in Norway. And this is an amazing place. This is so cool what you have here. We are not so fortunate to have this kind of service in the United States, and I just, I wish we could. I am just so impressed by what you do here, and I'm so pleased, and I think this is an amazing service, and I can't believe I get to come here and talk to you. Um, I wanted to include a couple of thank yous. So the reason I'm here, of course, is because I'm the chair of the Scientific Advisory Board for the 4P minus support group, which is the major family support group in the United States for persons with Wolf-Hirschhorn syndrome. And um, I, I mean, I can't even tell you how much fun it's been working with this group and how much I enjoy it. And um, the other thing, of course, is that most of the photos in the talk are courtesy of the members of the 4P minus support group. And then Amanda Lortz is the executive director of the 4P minus support group, and she is my number one collaborator in knowing anything about this. So she's my go-to when somebody says, has anyone ever seen this weird, you know, problem in anyone with Wolf Hirschhorn? And I say, Amanda, what do you know? And she gets back to me. So most of my knowledge really comes from Amanda and the other parents in the support group because there's just not that much in the literature. And of course, I also have to say thank you to, this is a picture of me with Dr. Carey, Dr. John Carey, right here. And he's my mentor. He taught me how to be a geneticist. And he's the one who said, we're having this great meeting. You have to come. And it was the 4P minus support group meeting. And that's how I got interested in Wolf Hirschhorn. And that's why I'm here. And then of course, Dr. Agatina Battaglia is also um, a uh, affiliated faculty member at the University of Utah, which is where I did my genetics training. And so he's another reason that I'm here and that I love Wolf Hirschhorn. And um, then just I have a list of my research collaborators here. And this is the symbol for the University of Utah. That's what that is. That's why that's there. So, okay. In the US, I always have to give disclosures. So I include a disclosure slide. Um, Linea Gen is a for-profit testing, genetic testing company in the US. And they, although they provide no financial support at all for me, they did for, provide financial support to the 4P minus support group for their research efforts. And so I always have to, I feel like I have to tell people that. I don't have any financial investments at all myself. So zero, all my money just comes from my salary at the University of Minnesota. So, and I'm not gonna talk about any weird medication usage. This is something that's a regulation in the US. I have to disclose if I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to do it. So it doesn't matter. Okay. So first topic is the background and pathophysiology of 4P minus disorders. I know we have a really div diverse audience with everything from medical geneticists and pediatricians all the way down to normal people. And as far as expertise in genetics. And so I've I've got some background in here because I feel like I can't just, I don't want to just throw terms at people. The other thing is if anyone hears something that's really confusing, please feel free to stop me if I'm being confusing and say, whoa, what does that mean? Because sometimes I don't realize when I'm talking doctor and being really confusing and using terminology that only I understand and maybe Dr. Carey if you were in the same room. So. Um, please feel free to stop me at any point, or if there's just questions, I'm happy to stop for questions. And I know Heidi's going to help me with Norwegian on questions, so we'll be okay. So the first thing, 
Wolf-Hirschhorn syndrome. What is Wolf-Hirschhorn syndrome? I know everybody here knows it, but I'm still going to talk about it anyway. So it's a disorder that's present from conception from the time that the egg is fertilized, and it's due to abnormal chromosomes. It's caused by a missing piece of the short arm of chromosome 4. The incidence that's always usually reported in the literature is 1 in 50,000 people, but we all feel, I think everyone here who does this, feels it's, it's probably pretty seriously underdiagnosed. Um, it, this was actually the first disorder ever found to be due to a missing piece of a chromosome. So this is a really key disorder in the history of medicine, as well as just being a cool disorder in general. Um, okay, a little bit about my terminology, the difference between Wolf-Hirschhorn and 4P-. So some people use them interchangeably, like they're the exact same thing. However, um, how I use it and how my mentors have used it is that Wolf Hirschhorn, and this is something Dr. Battaglia is really heavy on, and he's kind of the, the international expert. I know you had him before to talk about this, which is awesome. Um, so Wolf Hirschhorn is a specific subset of patients with abnormalities of the short arm of chromosome 4 who have a specific set of clinical findings. That's the way Dr. Battaglia defines it, and so that's what I'm going to go with because he's the expert here. And so 4P minus um, denotes that there's a missing piece of 4P, which is the short arm of chromosome 4, and we use that inclusively. So 4P minus is bigger than Wolf-Hirschhorn. So everyone with Wolf-Hirschhorn has 4P minus, but not everyone with 4P minus has Wolf-Hirschhorn. That's the way I usually use the terminology, and so that's what it means in my talk. Sometimes other people make them just be exactly the same thing, but I kind of big picture 4P minus, slightly smaller picture wolf for sure. Okay, we have no idea what the true incidence of 4P deletions is. So I don't know how many people would fit in this sort of bigger bubble at all. Okay, why is it called wolf for sure? So these are the citations of the two original reports. <clears throat> and here's the babies. So these are picture, this is a picture of the, two first, the first two babies ever reported with this disorder. Um, this is Hirschhorn's patient, and this is Wolf's patient. And the reason it's named Wolf-Hirschhorn syndrome is because traditionally genetic conditions are named after the doctors who made the first reports in the medical literature. And of course, if you talk to some of the older geneticists, because genetics as a specialty has really only been around since maybe the 60s, maybe. And even then, the specialty itself didn't really exist. And I think the board came into being in the US in the 80s. But, but if you talk to, for example, Dr. Opitz, who trained me, he's, what is he? He's getting to be probably in his 80s. Um, he argues about who made the first report of all of these things and what you should really call the disorder because possibly somebody else might have actually reported it first. But anyway, so this is this disorder is usually attributed to Drs. Wolf and Hirschhorn, and that's where the name comes in. Okay, just a few other things that I tend to throw out, as if people know I'm exactly what I'm talking about, even if they don't. DNA, and of course that's the full name of DNA. I'm not going to meander through it. DNA is a molecule found in every cell in the human body. And it's really just a chemical set of instructions. So it, it tells you how to make things in your body. Gene, of course, defining the word gene is actually ridiculously hard. <laughs> and it depends who you talk to. But to me, it's a discrete part of the DNA that does has a specific job, does a specific thing. So you can say, this chunk of DNA does exactly this. Um, we used to say that a gene was a piece of DNA that, that had the instructions for making a specific protein, but we know some genes don't make a functional protein. They do other things. And so I stay away from just the, the DNA protein definition. Two other words that I always throw around a lot because I love them because they're an important part of genetics and using genetics to actually help us take care of patients are genotype and phenotype. Genotype is what your, your DNA looks like, what information we get from your DNA testing. So in this case, in the setting of wolf hirschhorn syndrome, this is going to be how big is your chromosome deletion, where is your chromosome deletion. 
So genotype is if you find something by testing. So you could do blood testing. Usually we do blood testing. You can also test fibroblasts. You could test other body tissues. Then the phenotype, the phenotype is what you actually see when you look at the person. So that's, this, is, this is what's actually happening to the person. You can find that out by looking at the person and examining the person. So um, those, and I, I throw genotype and phenotype around a lot, so I feel like I should have it in my talk. Um, okay, a little bit, so I'm going to do a little bit of just basic genetics background. I know a lot of you guys know this stuff, but I feel like it always helps to be, make sure we're all on the same page with the terminology and everything. So chromosomes. Most humans have 46 chromosomes in every cell. There are two of each, there's 22 pairs, plus the sex chromosome pair, and typical female chromosome constitution is two X's. Typical male chromosome constitution is an X and a Y, and they're numbered by size. Number one is the biggest, and it should be that number 22 is the smallest, but actually 21 is the smallest. And um, this has to do with the limitations of karyotyping at the time when they were numbering the chromosomes. And it actually took us a surprisingly long time to figure out how many chromosomes there really were supposed to be. For a long time, they thought there were 48. And every time somebody would say there's 46, they'd say, well, you just did the karyotype wrong. So um, this was surprisingly hard to get figured out. Here's an example of chromosomes and how they look. And this is why we had trouble with 21 and 22 being bigger. It, it's a little hard to see the ends of these chromosomes. And of course, this is a really nice spread. But they couldn't see the tips well enough, and that's why they thought they were should be that way. And this is this is a female person as you can see by two X's and no Y. Um, so how you make these is you, you grow the cells uh, in a special medium and you smash them open, take a picture through a microscope, and then you blow up the picture. And they used to take out a scissors and cut around them. Now they do this electronically. And so they don't just come out. When I was first starting this, I thought they came out kind of looking like this. They don't line up like this by themselves. Someone else has to do it. And actually, you can see a little bit here, this is where they cut. There was actually one laying across right here, and they cut it off there. To, so they all, they all just sort of, you know, if you don't do it right, they're all laying on top of each other. So this is actually really challenging. And uh, when I did one, I put um, one of my X's up by the 8. Anyway, so these are really, really hard to do. Okay, a little bit more about chromosomes. Each chromosome is a single long DNA molecule. And the chromosomes really just serve as packages or volumes for DNA. It's kind of like the individual volumes in an old-fashioned encyclopedia set. And I have absolutely no idea how much longer I can even use this as a metaphor because people don't see volumes of books anymore. <laughs> and so it's going to get harder for me to explain to people what a chromosome deletion means when I can't talk about volumes of books for chromosomes. Um, and the purpose of the chromosome is it, it helps you store and um, separate your DNA at the time of cell division. Okay, a little basic chromosome anatomy because we just throw these terms around all the time. And, of course, I think I know what I'm talking about, but I never know if I should be making sure other people know what I'm talking about. Okay. So this is, this is um, the P arm. So... We're talking about, well, for shorter, 4P minus, right? So the P arm is the short arm. And it, P comes from petite in French, meaning small, right? I'm not very good at French. And this is the Q arm, which is the long arm. And because cytogeneticists are completely crazy, it doesn't mean anything in French. It's just because Q goes with P of all the things. So and this is why this is so confusing, because cytogeneticists are crazy. Um, and then that's the centromere. The centromere is um, the portion of the chromosome that is actually used to pull them apart, move them around. It's the spot where you hook, them on, hook on to pull them around. And then um, the tips are called telomeres. And we get really obsessed with telomeres in Wolf Hirshhorn because Typically, the tip, the telomere, the 4P, or the tip of the short arm, is what's missing. And so that's why this is relevant. So the, we'll say 
when we're talking about a 4P deletion, so a, a p missing piece of the short arm of the fourth chromosome, we'll say, well, did we take out the telomere or not? Is it missing? So the telomere is the tip. It's just the fancy word for the tip, and I'm sure it's from Latin or Greek or something like that. Okay, this doesn't project very well, but part of the problem is because um, karyotypes don't get you all that good of pictures. But this is so. This is a, a this is the chromosome four. This is a normal pair, and this is a pair with the telomere of the short arm of chromosome four missing. So the four P. To the tip of 4P, so here's here's 4, here's the centromere, here's P, and then there's this Dr. South, who's um, the cytogeneticist who trained me, she used to be at the University of Utah, now she works for a private company, but she's probably, when you're looking at cytogeneticists, which are the people who actually run the testing on chromosomes and do these tests and supervise the people who do these tests, she's probably the cytogeneticist for Wolf Hirshhorn. She's the cytogeneticist who's done the most research in Wolf Hirshhorn. She calls this the cotton ball. So she says the cotton ball is missing. Do you see how the cotton ball is missing on this one? So this is a telomeric deletion of 4P, meaning the tip is missing. And this is sort of the traditional look of, of Wolf Hirshhorn and how we diagnose Wolf Hirshhorn starting in the 60s. Okay, this is an array comparative genomic hybridization study, also known as a chromosomal microarray. This is another way of diagnosing wolf Hirschhorn syndrome. And this is probably how most of our patients now, for sure how most of our patients now are really diagnosed. Um, and this is really hard to see because this person has a very, very small terminal deletion of the telomere. So these are all the probes on the study and they're all lining up, see here's zero, so that's normal. So what they do is they norm it, and zero is normal. And here, do you see these green dots that are going to minus one? So there's there's one copy missing. So if it minus two, there'd be no copies because there's supposed to be two copies of every chromosome region because you have two fours. So every region on four has two copies, except when one is missing. So if there were no copies, you'd have minus two. If you had an extra copy, you could go to plus one. So there's a really small little deletion, and here's a this is a cartoon of the fourth chromosome here. Um, <clears throat> and this little, just a little piece of the last band is missing. So these stripes are called bands. And they start with the arm. So this is the P arm, this is the Q arm. And it hit, the weird numbering system has to do with how good we were at doing karyotypes. And so when they first started doing them, they could only see one they, this was all one piece. So that's where the one, so this is P13. So that's band one, subband three. And um, so you can see there's more. So originally they could only see one color on this when they first started looking at it. So it just had one band on the PR. And now it has all these little subbands. And then so you get subband three, and then they do point sub subband one here. So this is actually, so the key region for Wolf Hirshhorn is the tip. So that's, so, so it's band one, sub band six, sub sub band two. So we would say P16.2, that's how we'd say that. Not 16, common rookie mistake, one six. Otherwise Dr. South will bite me because she trained me to do this and she'd be really upset if I said 16. So there's the, oh, I forgot that I had that nice little air one box on there. <laughs> And this cannot be seen. This this person's deletion cannot be seen on the standard karyotype, which is the picture I showed you on the previous slide. You cannot see this. And a lot of our patients, their deletions cannot be seen on standard karyotype, which is the one I showed you before, and you have to use this study. So 4P deletions are different. Unlike a lot of other conditions due to a missing piece of a chromosome or microdeletion disorders, so like Williams syndrome is another disorder with microdeletion. They have a fairly standard deletion or velocardiofacial syndrome or DeGeorge, I forget people, that one has about 12 different names. They have a very standard deletion size. Um, this disorder has a highly variable deletion size. In fact, they're probably all different. And so you can see that um, 
you know, this is a very large one. So here's the, so here's 4P, or I mean, excuse me, excuse me, this is chromosome four up here. And this is from the genome browser, which is the way that geneticists like to look at chromosomes. Um, so here's the chromosome four, here's the centromere, so this is the P arm. And so this picture is using just this region here. And so this, this person has an extremely large deletion. This would be visible. You could do a karyotype, you'd see this easily because actually half the P arm is missing. So this person is very similar to the original reported patients. And then you can see down here, we have a couple of people who don't, who didn't quite clobber all of the telomere. So this is a, this is a, not a telomeric deletion. And I can't remember, did I stick some, aha, yep. So these deletions are telomeric. They get the tip, took out the tip. And uh, these do not. And from about here down or so, you would not be able to spot that on a karyotype. So you would have to do this microarray study or another specialized study. Okay. So these these people are just have just deleted part of the short arm of 4P. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about translocations. <clears throat> so translocation. During cell division, chromosome pairs line up and swap pieces. This is a normal process. Every time you, um, when you divide cells at the time of making a baby, you have to drop, swap pieces of your chromosomes. Um, when this happens between non-paired chromosomes, so usually you line up your one and your one and you swap a couple of pieces and then you go on with your life. If you accidentally swap pieces between chromosomes that have different numbers, for example, four and eight, that's called a translocation. Here's a, I got a little animation here. Okay, so I picked chromosome four and chromosome eight on purpose <laughs> because it's the most common translocation in wolf hirschhorn syndrome. So what happens is, is in, in wolf hirschhorn this is the most typical way the translocation. So you swap the tips of the P-arm of chromosome four and the P-arm of chromosome eight. This is the most common translocation that we find in wolf hirschhorn so you've got an eight, here's eight, see eight's smaller because the number is higher. And the, the P, the short arm of eight has swapped with the P, the short arm of four. So um, this, what we're seeing here, this would be a balanced translocation because all the parts are there, they're just in a different spot. So we call this balanced. So when this person goes to have children, <clears throat> they can give the child they're abnormal, this is the abnormal four. So we always name the chromosome based on whose center mirror we have. So this is an abnormal chromosome four. And then they passed on their normal eight. And then the other parent also has to contribute a chromosome four, you won't have the right number of chromosomes. And a chromosome eight. I made them a slightly different color so you could spot them. So then you've got a child here who has three tips from eight because two normal ones, one, two, and then this abnormal one that's stuck on a four, so that's three tips from eight. And only one tip of four because the other tip of four is gone. So you end up with a deletion of 4P because there's a piece of eight there instead. And you're, we'd also see you have, so you're, you have a deletion of 4P, you have an extra piece of 8P. And so we say they're monosomic for 4P and trisomic for 8P. So this is where some of these words come in because geneticists can't possibly be held down to one word for any particular problem. And so it just goes on and on. So this is, this is how patients, the most common translocation leads to a 4P deletion in a patient with wolf -Hirshorn. Now, there's lots of other ways this can happen. This is just the most common. Okay, so translocations and 4P disorders. Originally, we thought this was only a really small proportion. We thought most patients have what we call a pure deletion or the piece is missing. You're just missing a piece of 4P. That's your only genetic or chromosome problem. However, Dr. South has looked at this really hard and she's the, cyto the cytogeneticist who trained me at University of Utah. And Really, from a cytogenetics perspective, she is the leading expert on wolf Um She has shown that very subtle translocations can be found in up as many as 40% of 
of patients with Wolf Hirshhorn. However, even though I showed you this diagram of a parent with a balanced translocation transmitting an unbalanced translocation to the kiddo, most of the translocations actually knew in the child. So this happened during um, conception or right around the time of that the baby was formed, and it's not something that was passed down to a parent. So even though translo subtle translocations are really common in Wolf Hirshhorn, they're usually not transmitted from a parent, which is very important for the families because if you have a transmitted balanced translocation, of course, then they have a significant recurrence risk as far as having another kid who's affected. And so um, this, is, this is why we care about that particular piece. So most of these are, are new or what we call de novo, which I probably should have put on the slide. We like to use Latin as much as possible. No, but we still do it anyway. Okay, so um, a little bit more about translocations in 4P. The most common rearrangement, which is why I used it for my example, is between 4P and 8P. The second most common is between 4P and 11P. But there's a little bit of everything in the literature and in Dr. South's research. And so you, just because there's a, you can have any piece you want. Um, you can, and we've also seen some really odd rearrangements. Like um, there's, we have a couple of patients who have a different piece of chromosome four where that 4P should be. So something came off of Q and got stuck up there. Um, sometimes there are both missing pieces and extra pieces. Sometimes there's pieces next to each other from other chromosomes. I mean, you can get all kinds of really crazy stuff. So, um, so you can have very complex. The most common is just a missing piece of four, an extra piece of something else right where the four would have been. But you can see lots of other funny stuff. Um, the other problem, the, probably the biggest problem medically for a translo presence of a translocation is that extra piece of something else makes genotype phenotype correlation, i.e. I look at your test and I tell you something about your child or your patient harder because just like missing part of your chromosome can cause problems, having extra chromosomes causes problems. The most famous time that extra chromosomes cause problems is in Down syndrome. And most people are familiar with Down syndrome. They have an extra 21. Having an extra piece of a chromosome absolutely impacts your health or your phenotype. And so this extra piece makes phenotype genotype correlation harder, which, you know, we don't do genetic testing for fun, right? We do it to find out what's going to happen to the patient, right? I'm not just here to be like, whoa, chromosomes are cool. When you come to me as a geneticist, you're saying, how is my child going to do? How is my patient going to do? What do I need to do to keep them healthy? How long are they going to live? What problems are they going to have? And so I need to be able to look at this test and say, well, we need to be worried about this, but hopefully not this, right? That's the point. And so when you have this undetected teeny extra piece, that just throws a wrench into the whole works of this. So this is why it's important to know that that extra piece is there, as well as what's missing. <clears throat> and it just makes this whole genotype phenotype piece more difficult. Okay, contiguous gene deletion syndrome. wolf hirschhorn syndrome is a contiguous gene deletion syndrome. This means that it's caused by deletion of neighboring genes, and this deletion is a variable size. So wolf hirschhorn doesn't have a standard deletion. And the other piece of this is the findings are caused by a group of genes being deleted. So we were talking <laughs> last night at dinner and yesterday about some microdeletion disorders have one key gene, that if you hit that gene, then you have the syndrome. Wolf Hirschhorn does not appear to have this. You need to delete several genes to get Wolf Hirschhorn. And do we know which genes those are? Short answer, no. We're working on it. Okay, so the other thing is that Unrelated patients with wolf hirschhorn syndrome probably don't have the same deletion. If you see an identical deletion in two patients with 4P, they're almost always siblings with a parent who had a balanced translocation. And it's not very common, but we do have some patients where there's two in a family. But excluding siblings, Dr. South has not found two patients with the same deletion. Again, this makes 
predicting healthcare for Wolf Hirschhorn much, much harder. And just like I was talking about on the previous slide, on top of that, if you have unpredictable amount of extra material in that spot from somewhere else, even harder. So despite the fact that the whole point of somebody like me doing genetic testing is so I can help you take care of your child or take care of your patient or take care of your student and say, what do they need? What do we know about them? What can we say about things going forward? What do they need? This is really, really hard in Wolf Hirschhorn Center. Okay, again, a little bit more about contiguous gene deletion syndromes. So the key features of Wolf Hirschhorn Syndrome are due to what we call haploinsufficiency of several genes located on a relatively small region on 4P16.3, which is the last band of chromosome, the short arm of chromosome 4, like I showed you on the previous slide. Um, Dr. Battaglia and Dr. Zolino and Dr. Carey and Dr. South and many other really, really smart people have been working really hard on this, and we sort of cut our key genes down to this group, although we're not absolutely positive. So some combination of clobbering one copy of these, each of these genes somehow leads to Wolf Hirschhorn, we think. We're very confident about our decision-making in this disorder. I'm kidding. So, um, all right. So, and of course, we don't know what a lot of these genes really do either. That's another big problem. Okay. So, so how do you make a diagnosis of a 4P disorder? I'm going to talk a little bit about what might happen prenatally and then a little bit postnatally. Okay. So prenatal diagnosis. This is an actual um, picture of a uh, what we call a 4D ultrasound um, in the U.S. So it's a reconstructed prenatal ultrasound to kind of give you a good look at what the face looks like. I personally think that just looks like a really cute baby. So, um, <clears throat> so 4P disorders, even the most sort of severe end of wolf horsehorn are rarely suspected prenatally, rarely. We almost never get a prenatal diagnosis. Although, when I talk to the moms in our support group, they, a, a lot of them tell me there was concern about the growth of the baby or that they'd had ultrasounds and they kept changing the dating and they kept saying, oh, you're not nearly as far along as we thought you were and they keep moving the due date back. So I get this story from moms of the baby's due date getting moved back and moving back because the baby's not growing very well. The other thing that happens a lot prenatally is because the baby's not growing very well, they might suspect that the placenta is not working right and deliver the mom early. And really, those are the only two things that are consistently reported. And even that, I mean, a lot of moms tell me nobody thought there was anything wrong. Nobody said anything. We didn't have any suspicion there was anything wrong. So um, every once in a while, we suspect something. So um, if you're providing prenatal care, things that would make someone suspicious for wolf horn syndrome, poor growth is number one. And almost all the time, even with careful review of the case, the only thing you're going to find prenatally is poor growth. Um, a key piece of this, which actually differentiates it from placental dysfunction, which is always the first thing that, that OB doctors think of when they see a small baby, is that the head is small. So not just the body is small, but the head is also small. So this should be a tip-off, although sometimes it's not. Sometimes they see a heart defect. It depends how good your ultrasonographer is, because heart defects don't tend to be very severe. Generally, I mean, we do sometimes see severe defects, but those aren't common in wolf or at all. And so you might see a heart defect. They're, and the other thing is that heart defects are very easy to miss prenatal. So it's really, and if you're not worried about the pregnancy, you might not look that hard. Um, <clears throat> you might see cleft lip and cleft palate. Um, the times that I've personally seen wolf or get picked up prenatally, it's because there was cleft lip and palate, and so they did a better scan of the face. Um, and they did additional testing because of the presence of that birth defect, and that's how you got there. Um, you can see club foot. 
uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, so the, there's a hole in the diaphragm and some of the guts are coming up into the chest. That can be a tip off. It's not very common in Wolfershorn, but babies who have this finding tend to get more workup. So then you, not because you know that this is what they're gonna have, but just because you do more workup and then you figure it out. I have absolutely seen this recognized based on facial features on ultrasound, but you have to have a really incredible OB with genetics background. But I have seen that happen. Um, the, uh, there's, a, there's an obstetrician at the University of Utah who uh, is really good at facial features. She has a lot of genetics background and she picked up one just by scanning and looking and saying, huh, that baby's face looks like, might have, well, for sure, and lo and behold, so that, but that's very difficult. You have to have somebody who's really good. So this is, isn't she just as cute as, this is, this is one of my, our members of our support group, and her mom is letting me have this picture, and isn't she just darling? <laughs> so most patients are not diagnosed until after they're born. <clears throat> there are four key diagnostic features, and this is according to Dr. Battaglia, and he is the expert, so I'm going to go with him. So the distinctive facial features are one of the key diagnostic features. Um, sometimes we call this the facial gestalt, and I'm sure there are some people who have some German background, and that comes from, I believe, we usually translate it into English as form or figure or something along those lines, but it's just the, it's the look of the whole face together. So something that, um, sometimes people even say Augenblick gestalt, so just a glance and the look of everything together, the whole face together. Um, and I have a little bit more about the facial features in a minute. Um, and then the growth problems, because most of the babies are very small. And like I said, that's the thing that you can pick up prenatally. I find the reason that they come to medical attention is the developmental problems. And then they also have neurological problems. Okay, a little bit more about the facial appearance. So if you're looking in the literature You'll see the term Greek warrior helmet. Um, some of my colleagues who work in the 4P minus support group have surveyed our patients, and a lot of the, some of the patients find that term bothersome, so I don't use it. But just in case you're looking in a textbook or something, it's almost invariably there. Um, so I just wanted to warn people, I don't use that anymore. So key features, white spaced eyes, so the eyes are, are farther apart than you would anticipate. The eyes are prominent. The eyebrows are arched. The nasal bridge or glabella, which is the area between your eyebrows, is very prominent. The mouth is small, the jaw is small, and the philtrum is short. The philtrum is this spot right on your upper lip between those two lines that come down. And um, the whole what's really going on with the gestalt or the whole picture of the face is that the eyes are big and the smaller part, the lower part of the face is actually small. So this kind of, you get this part's bigger and this part's smaller. Doctor, um, there's a doctor in England who's done some really systematic studies. Dr. Quarrell, Dr. Oliver Quarrell, he's in England, has done some really neat facial mapping, facial, facial recognition software looking at this. Okay, so a little bit more, I'm just looking at the, now we're looking at the facial gestalt and the two original patients. So, um, when I look at this, I think Hirsch, Wolf's patient has a more typical Wolf Hirschhorn facial gestalt than Hirschhorn's patient. So the, the pieces that we're looking at, both of these babies, of course, have wider spaced eyes. This is baby's just beautiful eyes here. So they're a little bit farther apart than you would expect. Um, both babies, you can see, have a small mouth, small jaw. The jaw is really small. And then the filtrum is short, so the distance between the nose and the upper lip is short. So those features are present in both babies. But uh, Wolf's baby also has the beautiful arched eyebrows and then some prominence through the glabellar region, which I find to be the most sensitive feature when you're looking at the face for Wolf Hirschhorn is the arched eyebrows and the prominence of the glabella because there are lots of other disorders that can give you wide spaced eyes and a small mouth and a small jaw. Okay, so this is a picture from a paper recently published by doctors Carrie Battaglia and South, who I've already brought up a bunch already. Um, just look in here. This is a this is a photo composite showing some of the facial features and then um, the deletion sizes. And you can see all of these kids have wider spaced eyes. So these kids. So she has a little bit more of a typical facial appearance. You look at her, and you really 
think, oh, she might have wolf horsehorn. Um, these kiddos, not as much. I wouldn't just spot them, right? You were not going to just be like, wow, that's wolf horsehorn, you know? So, um, and these these two kiddos have a slightly smaller deletion. And uh, she's beautiful. I've met her before. She's just lovely. Um, but you can see the wider spaced eyes, prominent glabella and arched eyebrows here, and then the smallness of this part of the face. Okay. So, um, doing a little bit of genotype, phenotype correlation. Dr. Carey has worked really hard on this. Um, okay. Um, so these are three patients who have small deletions and variable pieces of the facial phenotype. And actually, I defy you to tell that she has well first horn just by looking at her. And um, in fact, some people would say she doesn't have well first horn, she has just 4P minus. And then um, and this patient really has a lot of facial features. He has a surprisingly small deletion. So this is the first patient that was on that slide. This is the second patient. I actually know their names, and I'm having to control myself not to say their names. Um, this patient, so this is the patient that was on the left. This is the patient, this is in the middle, and the patient that was on the right. And he has a very small deletion, and yet he has the most significant facial gestalt, most people would say, as far as tipping you off to where his deletion is going to be by looking at his face. So, and this is a sort of a zoomed-in picture of this is zoomed in off of that same genome browser that I showed you before. So this is, here's 4P16.3, the, the key band there. And you can see some of the, I've just pointed out some of the, the genes that we get worked up about that we don't really understand. Okay, all right, next, next typical feature, growth. I have to say this is the most common feature of all of these features. In, um, in patients with 4P disorders, almost always very, very poor. And it's been present from before birth. If you have any data from pregnancy, you'll find out the baby wasn't growing, growing all that well even before. Um, this, despite the fact that they have feeding problems, this is not growth, this problem, growth problem is not due to poor feeding only. And so, um, Adequate, inadequate calories will not rescue the growth problem. You can't, just, you can't feed them enough to make them grow normally. This is something that's really, really, really important for caregivers to remember. Um, and we have tried growth hormone. We just don't know how much it helps. There's just no data. Nobody systematically looked at the patients who have used growth hormone. It has been used. Okay. <clears throat> Development. I'd say developmental delays, abnormal development, is the second most consistent feature after poor growth. We do have patients who have normal cognition. That is not something that people realize when they look at the literature. If you just Google or if you go into a genetics textbook, they won't, you won't find this. But there are patients who have normal cognition, although that's rare. So you shouldn't expect your patient to have normal cognition necessarily, but it's possible. Um, the textbooks... Um, will report pretty much universally very severe intellectual impacts. And that is when you meet large groups of patients with, and I know that Frambu has some new data, exciting data coming out on this, that we've looked at this. Um, in my experience, when you meet groups of patients who have wolf horn, they are not as delayed as the textbooks and the, and the literature says they are. Um, because the, the, you know, the, the, counseling that a lot of my parents have gotten is the kid will never walk, your child will never talk. And that's actually not the case. Um, we even have some patients who can read and do math, which is not something that would normally be expected based on our historical understanding of this diagnosis. In fact, one of my patients literally told me that math is his favorite subject during a visit. Um, the other feature about development and Wolf-Hirshhorn syndrome is that they continue to make developmental progress throughout their lifespan. Last time I went to a national meeting, which we do every two years in the U.S., um, one of the moms ran up to me and she said, she told me, her, her son, who's an adult, he's a young adult, started walking and saying, Mom, and he had never done that before. So he hadn't been walking and talking prior to that. He had just turned 18 and started walking and talking. And she was really excited. 
The other piece that's important to remember is developmental regression is not typical for wolf pressure. They make additional developmental progress lifelong. And so if you're seeing regression, that means we sh there's something else we should be doing. We should be looking into something else. <coughs> Neurological problems, extremely common. Almost all patients have some level of significant neurological problems. The big piece is seizures. Almost everybody has seizures. We do have patients who have never had a seizure, even all the way through their life. But most patients will have seizures. And usually it comes on relatively early in the first year of life. The typical pattern is that you have seizures early in life, and then they get better. And then they get worse again, we're finding. And then the other piece is that the seizures in wolf Hirshhorn are very susceptible to fever. So um, patients who have epilepsy, i.e. recurrent seizures, will get worse when they're sick. And our patients who rarely have seizures will seize when they're, when they're having a high fever. Also, Dr. Batelli has done a lot of work on this. A lot of patients have an abnormal EEG, which is an electro, um, the electronic study of the brain where they stick the stickers all over your head and look at your brain waves. If you do that right, a lot of the patients have an abnormal EEG even if they're not having seizures. So this is a really big piece of health for patients with wolf horn. Other common problems, congenital heart defects. This gets made a big deal of by patients, by doctors who are not experienced with wolf horn. They get really worked up about the congenital heart disease. We have patients who have severe congenital heart defects. Um, we have patients who have hypoplastic left heart, meaning they were born with only half of their heart. But most patients with wolf horn have very mild heart defects. So they're usually, I mean, it's usually an ASD or a VSD. And it's, which are pretty straightforward to repair. So this is actually not a very common cause of death in wolf horn, despite the fact that if you talk to Doctors aren't experienced with this sort of, they'll get really worked up about the heart disease. <clears throat> hearing problems are big. Um, patients get re recurrent ear infections. Um, you can get a secondary conductive loss because of ear infections. And then we also do see nerve-related hearing loss, and that can be progressive. So this is a really important issue to address in kids with little horn. Um, also, eye problems are really common. And they're all kinds of different things, actual malformations of the eyeball, malformations of the nerve that goes to the eye, um, vision problems like nearsightedness, farsightedness, astigmatism, sort of more typical problems. <clears throat> there are a lot of dental problems. Cleft open palate is relatively common. Um, and all of our patients who answer, whoever I've ever spoken to this about this report abnormal teeth or delayed, particularly delayed teeth. So the teeth come in late, both the primary and secondary dentition. And if you, every person I've asked this problem, this question of has said, yes, my child had this problem. So they pretty much all have that, best I can tell. Don't have formal data on that. Are we running out of time? But good, because that's actually the next talk. That was my last, that's my last slide. That was perfect. Okay, good. thank you for very interesting. And uh, I think everyone understand Hopefully they do. Uh, are there any questions? No special. Her i salen. Yeah. Eivind. Well, thank you for your lecture. <laughs> uh, one is this just in general. Why do you why do you use the term um, um, disorder instead of sin? We would use the word syndrome. To, to uh, and you used, is there a reason for that? What, what's the difference between a disorder and a syndrome? Oh boy, they're pinning me down on the important terminology stuff. So the, um, that's a really good question. Um, so I think the reason that I tend to say disorder instead of syndrome is um, to avoid stigma. Um, and that's probably has to do with some of the nuances about how people act in the US. And I'm sure you have different, in different countries, I'm sure you have problems with different words. And so my, 
I think where I, the reason I do that is because people tend to take syndrome very seriously in the States and they have predisposed ideas about what, is, what it means when I say syndrome. And I don't know if anyone has seen um, The Incredibles. It was a Disney Pixar movie from uh, now it's probably six years ago. And there's the, the bad guy's name is Syndrome. And, uh, and uh, so in the U.S. it has a little bit of a negative connotation. But you're absolutely correct, this is a syndrome. Because a syndrome is a group of medical problems, usually including birth defects, that has a single underlying cause, has a definable underlying cause, even if we don't know what it is. So wolf horn is absolutely a syndrome from the appropriate medical terminology. And the reason I use disorder is because of stigma, probably. I never thought about it before, but... I think that's why. I think it's because of stigma. Thank you. 